You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 398 of the podcast. And in this one, I chat with Dr. Maggie Perry. Now, Maggie has been on the show before. And Maggie is a licensed clinical psychologist based in Denver, Colorado, and founder of Relatable Health. We discuss an update on her, mood disorders, how mood disorders affect OCD and vice versa, working with mood disorders alongside OCD, how to adjust therapy for the two disorders, behavioral activation, negative core beliefs, group therapy for OCD and mood. We discuss guilt and much more. And thank you to OCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. So thank you to Maggie for her time. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with her. And thank you to you guys for listening. It means a lot. And without further ado, here is Maggie. Welcome back to the show, Maggie. Thanks so much, Stu. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here again. Uh, And obviously, we we saw each other again recently in Colorado or in Denver. Um, I'm wearing my Colorado hoodie just for you today. Love it. Um, Love, Love it. Yeah, so we got to catch up then. Um, but yeah, what, what's been going on with you work-wise um, since, since you came on? Were you a Huddle Care, right, when you last yeah. came on? Yeah, so several years ago, I was running Huddle.Care, which was focusing on online groups for anxiety and OCD disorders. And um, I ended up joining a, a large psychiatric practice to try to build out more groups for um, those with anxiety and OCD. Um So that ended up being a challenge and it had some challenges that I chose not to continue to work on and I chose to go back into private practice. So now my company is called Relatable Health and it kind of, that practice focused on treatment resistant depression and other mood disorders. So I had a good amount of time to learn more about mood disorders and how they are comorbid with anxiety and OCD for some people. And so now my practice is kind of focusing on anxiety and OCD, but also mood disorders and especially in populations that are comorbid. Yeah. Okay. And how have you found that transition to bringing in, bringing in more mood related um, symptoms? Yeah. So I think in the clients that I was seeing before, they, people often have mood disorders. Hmm. And so it, it maybe it was just, not necessarily their presenting problem, or maybe they didn't notice that they had a mood disorder or the differential diagnosis around their mood disorder wasn't as well understood. So I, I'm just finding that I'm more um, um, attentive to mood symptoms as well as anxiety and OCD symptoms. Yeah. Okay. So maybe they were there all along in the, some of your clients, but you weren't purposely looking out for it before. Yeah. Or I, okay. I didn't have the working conceptualization that I have now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So is it worth, um, actually, uh, where do we start? Okay. So the more generic question is, is why, why is it important to, to focus on mood or keep an eye out for it or factor it in? Do you think w- within OCD and anxiety? Sure. So I think, um, what can be a challenge is that OCD is incredibly demoralizing. So many people that experience OCD, especially for a long time without treatment, feel kind of hopeless and helpless about their their treatment and their progress, but maybe don't actually have a biological mood disorder. So the differential between feeling demoralized by OCD, but um, having a lift in mood when you get appropriate OCD treatment and having a comorbid biological mood disorder um, that comes with all the symptoms associated with that mood disorder 
can make um, when someone has that comorbid biological mood disorder, it can make OCD treatment really challenging. And it's really not just demoralization, making it so that you'd want to have OCD treatment first. You'd actually want to treat the mood disorder first, keeping in mind what's going on with their OCD also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions of, yeah, w- w- which do you kind of go go for first, you know, which, which whether it's OCD or mood, but is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, like which comes first? Sure. So I think if, you know, someone is having all the symptoms of depression, including anhedonia, which is the lack of interest in things they usually find pleasurable, feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, and worthlessness and guilt, um, also major changes in eating and sleeping, um, which really suggest a biological change that the person's experiencing, crying spells, irritability. Um, these are all major symptoms of a depressive episode. Um, also on the other side, um, extremes in energy and talkativeness, racing thoughts, and not sleeping can all be symptoms of hypomania or mania. Um, and so when that's happening, the mind is going to get stickier. So the person is probably going to ruminate more and probably have more intrusive thoughts. Um, but it can be really difficult to slow down enough to do appropriate OCD treatment, including exposure and response prevention, or to have the motivation to have the courage to do ERP. Um, if the person is also experiencing a mood a mood episode, so typically I would treat that mood episode the mood episode first, it's, as we talk more, you'll see that there's actually parallels between exposure and response prevention and behavioral activation and cognitive restructuring, which are the main interventions for mood disorders. So it's not as though it's completely separate treatment. You know, you could have the conversation kind of at the same time, but in terms of what someone might do for homework, they might focus on their mood symptoms more than their OCD treatment symptoms, at least from my perspective, that tends to be what is most helpful for people. Yeah, Yeah, really good point. I'm glad you brought up uh, behavioral activation and cognitive restructuring. We'll definitely, I'll definitely ask you about those in a bit. Um, So I guess the question I had in my mind was, and I'm sure it's different per person, but what what comes first? Uh, The mood symptoms, then the OCD, the OCD, then the mood symptoms, or is it obviously going to be varying based on case? Yeah, so they're both chronic intermittent conditions mm. that have bio, biological, social, social, and psychological aspects to them. So mm. I do think it varies among people, but it's um, definitely worth tracking both mood symptoms and OCD symptoms for that reason. For some people, the biological symptoms come first. So there's changes in eating and sleeping and more anhedonia, and then rumination, sticky thoughts, and um, negative core beliefs being activated. So kind of cognitive symptoms come after biological symptoms for some people. Um, Some people are more um, likely to have the cognitive symptoms first. And I think in that case, the OCD might show up first. So the person that has sticky thoughts and ruminative thoughts and worried thoughts first, Hmm. that's going to look more like OCD. But then if those go untreated, they'll get the biological symptoms of mood also. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And And actually uh, in that case, you, you could treat the cognitive symptoms as quickly as you can so that the person's less likely to have the biological symptoms. Okay. That's interesting. Um, uh, We've talked about how mood can hinder um, OCD treatment, you know, how it can get in the way of ERP and can it go the other way where OCD hinders treatment for the mood? Absolutely. Yes. Mm. Because, um, in both cases, you want to do the opposite. So where anxiety avoidance creates, maintains and intensifies OCD. So, um, exposure is the antidote to the OCD. Um, kind of withdrawal is an avoidance is the major symptom of depression. Mm. So behavioral activation is the antidote to depression. And so 
if in the context of OCD symptoms, the person starts to avoid a lot, they're also creating a scenario where their mood symptoms of avoidance are more likely to occur. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you you mentioned behavior activation there. Um, yeah, let's let's talk about that for a bit. What what is it for those that aren't aware? Yeah, so it's doing things you value regardless of what you feel. So I think one of the difficulties with um, depression is that people think if I get my body moving, then I should feel good. And it's true that when you're not suffering from depression or, um, yeah, I'm going to stick with depression. When you're not struggling with depression, typically things that you value are going to be positively reinforcing. So you get lunch with a friend and it feels really great. You finish your homework and it feels really great. You do other tasks that are either inherently rewarding or give you some, you value for some reason. And in general, that makes you feel good that you've done those activities Hmm. and so when your mood is sluggish and anhedonic and um wearing you down those same things may not actually feel good and then that those feelings may make you want to withdraw even more Hmm. but if you compare it to the process of doing exposure and response prevention for anxiety that thinking that you're going to go do things that make you anxious on purpose, you're going to get anxious, more anxious at first, but you're going to get less anxious later is the same thinking that you'd have for depression, where you'd say, I'm going to go do things that I typically like doing or are typically rewarding for me, even though, and I'm going to expect that I'm not going to feel good doing them at first. But if I commit to doing these things habitually over time, my mood is going to lift. I'm going to start to get the positive reinforcement and then, um, you know, then I'm going to continue to value these activities and they're going to actually help me prevent mood Mm. episodes in the future. With that in mind, you do want to consider subtle avoidant behaviors. So um, just going to lunch with a friend, if you're worrying the whole time or ruminating after, um, or avoiding vulnerability, as an example, hmm. um, you may still be like kind of forcing yourself through the behaviors, but it still experience the mood symptoms, the internal mood symptoms yeah. um, that can make it your life feel really forced. I think a lot of people with um, any of the depressive disorders experience their functioning is really forced. And so if you're just like with OCD, some people don't like avoid in a situational kind of way or compulse in a physical kind of way. They have more internal or mental symptoms. And with depression, you can also have mental symptoms that maintain Mm -hmm. the disorder, even if you're functioning, um, you know, just, just fine in your everyday life. Yeah. Okay. So yes, yeah, so as you do behavior um, activation, becoming aware of still what's going on in your mind, and if you're ruminating or doing any um, internal compulsions, for want of a better word. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Behavioral activation is the major intervention, just like exposure is the major intervention. But if you yeah. don't do the cognitive work along with the behavioral activation, you can still suffer from the disorder just like Mm. ocd if you don't do the cognitive work you can still have tons of anxiety even if you're doing exposure yeah good point good point um so the 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 thing with behavioral activation it's definitely a useful tool and i use it when appropriate um the, the the thing that's i guess anyone listening might think well if someone's depressed or if i'm depressed and and i suddenly you know get tasked with doing something that i enjoy um the thing with depression is you you don't have the energy right or the motivation or the the will not will pass wrong you you know where i'm getting at you don't have the desire to 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 go do whatever it is so how do you when you're working with someone how do you get them to just go do one thing or push themselves to yeah do one thing 
Yeah, it's definitely got to be the smallest next step. And the person has to understand the conceptualization that it's not necessarily to really, you know, um, show up to class and have the best day of school or show up to work and have the best day at work. Again, you're not trying to have the best social experience you've ever had, um, but rather you're trying to challenge your mood. So you're doing whatever your smallest next step is, which could be putting your shoes on and opening your front door, making it to the mailbox. Um, it could be, you know, whatever the smallest, ne- whatever you're avoiding and is the smallest next step in the context of your life. But in the example of like, just put your shoes on, you're not necessarily hoping to get a good workout in. You're just noticing your mood symptoms and saying, hey, mood this is not me. I'm not choosing to live according to what you want me to be doing. So I'm going to actively challenge you in some way, which Mm -hmm. is very similar to the way you challenge anxiety, that you're not necessarily challenging your anxiety so that you have the best outcome. um, But rather you're doing exposure for its own sake to the anxious experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And do you find that with behavioral activation for mood, it, it's a, it's maybe a slow process at first and then, and then they gain momentum as they do start to get that positive uh, feedback again, or was it, yeah, does it differ for some people? It's quite quick, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think depending on the intensity of the biological symptoms, it can really be a slog. You can yeah. really suffer from depression for a long time and many people do Mm. um sometimes when people get it just like with anxiety it um mood changes quickly um which can be a delight but it can also really be a slog of committing day after day to regular hygiene regular eating regular sleeping regular movement, doing things you value, even though they feel terrible. And like, it's a huge leap of faith to do that day after day, week after week, even when it doesn't feel good. And mood changes sometimes are quite gradual. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's good to know. It's it's for anyone maybe struggling with it a bit that it takes some time. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, And Cognitive restructuring, um, tell us about that and why that might be helpful for mood. Sure. So oftentimes people have narrative, in addition to the biological vulnerability, um, people have narratives that make them feel hopeless, helpless, and worthless. So depression isn't just lots and lots of sadness or lots and lots of guilt. It's often hopelessness, helplessness, or worthlessness on top of the experience of Mm. sadness. And so first of all, um, how I would frame up cognitive restructuring would start with kind of the three component model of emotion. So you'd want to start monitoring sensations, thoughts, and behavioral urges that are associated with common emotions that someone is experiencing. And then we'd want to look at like the secondary interpretation of that. So if they had sensations, thoughts, and behavioral urges associated with guilt, for instance, which could be because of their their excessive guilt associated with their OCD, then we'd also want to look at like, when you feel guilt, do you also feel hopeless? When you feel guilt, do you also feel worthless? And then in looking at that, I would want to know what kind of narratives maintain that sense of helplessness or worthlessness um, and kind of help the person come up with a more compassionate narrative or even kind of identifying the emotion in that way and the secondary process in that way can disarm it in its own right. And so just by talking these things through, journaling, being in a support group, talking about it in psychotherapy, they can all generate self-understanding in a way that helps the person cope with those feelings more effectively. Oh, good point. And, and something that hit me there was, I didn't actually ask you to define mood which I probably should have done at the start. So, yeah, so I guess how would you define mood? Um, 
it's so in, I think it's in your understanding sorry not like yeah that the yeah. psychological definition i think mood informs life so emotions are the primary driver of who we are and how we show up in the world what we choose to do and why and when mood is functioning healthfully or like um yeah healthfully um it goes along with our values and our circumstances. And so when things are going well, we're in a good mood. When things are going poorly, we're in a bad mood. But that can, those, the, the mood and the emotions associated with the mood kind of fluctuate according to how life is going. And when I think you have a, when someone has a mood disorder, the mood is not necessarily consistent with the circumstances. It, it can change based on its own uh, rhythm um, associated with seasons or um, other biological factors like hormones um, and also like sleeping patterns. Um, but it's like the mood is kind of out in front of the person's circumstances and or it's variable depending on the circumstances. And then the interpretations of what that means for a person, e either their mind can get sticky and ruminative because of the mood changes or the biological changes create these um, changes in the way the person's interpreting what's happening in their life that makes the mood symptoms worse. So healthy mood, to put more simply, healthy mood informs our lives and help us become and be the people that we want to be. Um, a mood disorder can create havoc and chaos and make us feel confused about what we're motivated by and why. Yeah, good point. And, and you brought up there like um, hormonal changes that affect mood and, 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 and all of that. And um uh, well, I did an episode recently or a story that, that talked about um, uh, uh, perimenopause. Sorry, I can't remember that. Yeah, it slipped my mind sure. for a second. And obviously that can bring its own hormonal changes. And uh, for women, their, mm -hmm. their monthly cycles obviously could affect mood. Um, and then for, for guys too, there's diff differing periods and then obviously in adolescence that in and of itself can create big mood changes and so i guess i don't know if there's anything you wanted to add or, or do more articulately than i'm able to do currently on these these biological hormonal shifts that we all get as humans um and whether that complicates therapy even if it's complicating it just in that week of therapy you know whatever's going on so if that's something you see or yeah definitely so i don't I don't absolutely, um, uh, absolutely understand kind of the biological forces associated with hormones, but what I see cognitively and behaviorally mm. is that as people sleep differently, eat differently, move differently, um, they also can become irritable. They can have yeah. crying spells. Um, they can just act differently with their friends and family, and then the concept or in their other important role functioning like work or school. And so those kind of, again, like biological changes that manifest themselves behaviorally have an impact on how life goes. And then that becomes a vicious cycle because then people respond to them differently. Then they have different types of thoughts. Then Ooh. they're ruminating or having sticky thoughts yeah. and then all their symptoms come back. Yeah, it just feeds into that mood cycle and, and depressive cycle if it's there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah gosh. Yeah, and, it, you know, I, I didn't sleep that well the other night. Um, yeah, I won't share the reason, but I didn't get much sleep, and it was very broken and very interrupted. And, and, and the next day I was very irritable and very snappy and probably not pleasant to be around. Um, and if that was happening on a regular basis... I could then see that that feedback is going to feed into my my mood, my belief about myself that you know I'm someone people don't like or um, get annoyed at. You know, yeah. Um, 
And that's not saying that lack of sleep is going to cause a mood disorder, but it's just to say if you've already got one and then these other factors come in, these hormonal changes or lack of sleep or nutrition isn't quite right and maybe we're eating way too much sugar and then that's messing with our, our mood. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think just like with the pandemic, more people um, have experienced clinical, clinically significant levels of anxiety. Hmm. Um, of you know about the probably as a consequence of the uncertainty of that period of time. Um, I think just because you're mentioning kind of even if you don't have the by the the mood the underlying mood mm-hmm. disorder. I think the social isolation associated with the last couple of years likely made people that were not necessarily um, clinically, biologically vulnerable to mood disorders gave Mm. them more um, mood symptoms. Mm. Um, So you might be at a subclinical level, but if for any reason your life circumstances slowed down the amount of movement you got, changed how you slept, made you more socially withdrawn. Those are kind of life circumstances that can mimic a mood disorder. And, and so mm-hmm. for some people, they, if you don't also have anhedonia and hopelessness, helplessness and worthlessness, you can kind of work yourself out of those yeah. circumstances relatively quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but for other people, they can spiral into depression quite easily. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so then, um, yeah, like negative, uh, core beliefs. Um, maybe it's worth us talking about that. Like how do they come into play or how do they develop within us stick and, um, I guess drive our mood or behaviors. Sure. So when I'm thinking about negative core beliefs, I'm often thinking about self world and future. So I'm bad, unlovable, not good enough, worthless in some way. Um, The world is dangerous, scary, um, not safe for me in some way. And this is always going to happen. This is, um, things are never going to get better. Things are never going to change. So those are typically um, the types of thoughts that we're thinking about when we're thinking about having negative core beliefs. And all kinds of life circumstances can contribute to why someone might feel that way, whether that's in early life or in their present time. Um, And so those kind of map on with the feelings of worthlessness, helplessness, and hopelessness, where worthlessness is feeling like you're bad or unlovable or not good enough in some way. Um, Helplessness is feeling like you can't be effective in the world and kind of affect change or have control and mastery the way that you're hoping and hopelessness is like things are never going to change. And so I think psychotherapy can target, um, all of those things. So again, building self understanding around what's contributing to your sense of worthlessness. And I think trying to become more flexible about the context, which may have contributed to that worthlessness and how, um, kind of true that those mm. that that feeling is compared to like how it might be informed by the particular context that the that you're living in or you lived in at the time um and then also with the world um and the safety of the world and the ability to be efficacious in the world um if you for whatever reason had life circumstances early in life or even in the present time where it's difficult to be effective or you were, you had kind of traumatizing experiences of helplessness. Um, Working through those experiences would be looking for ways that you can be effective now, even, and that was then, this is now, Mm. how can we help you be effective now? And then that can help you feel more, I mean, not just efficacious, but worthy. Um, Mm. And then it also can help you feel like things change. So, being doing things that make you feel worthy and doing things that make you feel effective can then help you feel hopeful about the future. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and your background is obviously, well, um, it's more than this, but is 
as much for I know you, it's groups, right? That's what you, when I first met yeah. you, that's, that's, you were the group person. Uh, I love groups. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So you're still doing them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question was really just, do you see that groups are quite effective for, for mood and OCD combined, you know, like do, do the people when they're in the groups, are they able to, where am I going with it? Kind of like help each other around the mood symptoms as much as they can the OCD or inspire yeah. each other. Or... One part of mood symptoms that we haven't touched on so much yet is isolation and social withdrawal. Mm. Um, and and the beliefs that come with that, like that I don't fit in, I'm not good enough, um, I can't connect with other people. And so I think a healthy group is inherently um, therapeutic, regardless of the topic of the group, because it can make people feel like they fit in and increase common humanity, increase a sense of connection, and overcome that sense of like, I'm not worthy enough to be connected to other people. Mm. and I can't do anything to help myself connect to other people. Um, so that's where I see it's really the connection that group can provide that yeah. I think is most healing for a mood disorder. Yeah. Um, and then I think things like altruism. So helping other people in the context of the group, it's great for mood symptoms. Um, I think learning from other people, being inspired by other people. So when you're really feeling anhedonic and down and sluggish, not wanting to do your um, behavioral activation, hearing what other people commit to and that they actually follow up on it can give you the motivation to do it, even if you don't feel, um, again, you don't get the positive reinforcement right away from it. So I think mm-hmm. that um, has the th- is the same impact that an anxiety group has, that um, hearing other people do exposures can give you the courage to do exposures yourself. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, group has a lot of benefits for mood. Yeah, and 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 I guess this is the same for an anxiety group. But the kind of shame came to mind, and and hearing others with the same sort of mood based symptoms uh, being shared, or maybe things arguments they've had with people because of a mood or whatever it was, or they weren't feeling great. Mm-hmm. Hearing others share that might help them with their own shame of okay, it's not just me, you know. Yeah, I think just like um, OCD can have real implications for Mm. um, the way you function, the way your relationships go, um, if you're able to achieve your goals in life, um, mood symptoms have the same quality. And I think, unfortunately, um, either the self-stigma or the stigma from others around like laziness and um, lack of reliability that can come with a mood disorder Mm. can be quite um, shaming and even traumatizing for a person, especially if you, you know, you have variability in your functioning, but you don't quite know that it's a mood disorder. So sometimes Mm. you can be super productive and other times, you know, totally procrastinating and lacking in functioning and not able to keep up with your commitments. And so that variability is just hard to live with um, and hard to overcome even once you're in treatment and you're starting to be more consistent, um, living with the ramifications of having some period of time where you had those behaviors um, Mm. takes quite a bit to work through. And so whether you do that in individual psychotherapy or you get the support of other people who have been through the same thing, I think that um, kind of shame and self-criticism about previous symptoms and their implications mm. is another component of treatment. Yeah. Okay, cool. And and how often are you doing groups at the minute? Is it every week so, still? Yeah, so I've maintained what I call community time, um, which is a free support group for people with mood disorders and OCD and anxiety disorders. And I have a newsletter. So we have a number of, we have a different topic every week, whether it's perfectionism or uncertainty, negative core beliefs, I've written different things about these different topics and people come to community time and kind of say what they're suffering from. We talk about the topic of the week, including in discussion questions, and then everybody commits to something. So whether they're committing to exposures or they're committing Mm -hmm. to behavioral activation, it's whatever is relevant for them. Um, So right now I'm just doing the community time, um, but people are welcome to contact me if that's of interest to them. Um, 
I'm hoping to do more group um, mm. in the future, but I'm kind of just getting back into private practice. So I'm still kind of building that yeah. offering, but I still do believe in the power of groups and I think they're incredibly therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and is relatable.health your website? Yeah, relatable.health is my website. I think where that name is coming from is that um, I still, just like huddle meant to be a metaphor for people kind of huddling together to get a strategy to relate to their anxiety and OCD effectively, relatable is meant to focus on the ways in which people can relate to themselves more effectively, but also relate to other people more effectively as they get mood and OCD treatment. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, cool. And I'll put the link to the, uh, to the website in the show notes as well. Um, so you mentioned guilt within OCD earlier, and obviously guilt can be a big emotional factor within OCD, especially around some of the taboo themes and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Do you see that really maybe triggering or amplifying the mood disorder when there is a lot of OCD guilt around symptoms? Yeah. Absolutely. And so I think guilt becomes um, kind of a a jumping block for, or a, a block to jump off, that a mood can jump off of. If when someone experiences guilt, they also experience worthlessness, helplessness, or hopelessness. Mm. Sometimes guilt stays as guilt, like some, especially if either the person doesn't have a biological vulnerability or they don't have other life circumstances that have kind of taught them that they're worthless. If they feel guilty, um, you know, the guilt can stay in the context of OCD, but for a lot of people, it really makes th that the degree of guilt that they experience really makes them feel worthless or helpless or hopeless. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's just them feeding into that cycle. Um, Okay. So is, is there anything else on mood that, that we haven't talked about that you'd want to bring up today? Yeah. The other thing that um, I briefly touched on, but I guess want to reiterate is, especially if you think that you're having mood symptoms and you don't have access to care right away, or you're considering getting into care at some other point, I think immediately tracking your mood um, and immediately focusing on hygiene, eating habits, sleeping habits, um, and movement are like things that you can immediately do on your own in kind of a self-care type way, uh, or I mean a self-help kind of way. And so eMoods is an app you can use that has, um, uh, you know, entries that can help mm. you pinpoint important part, important aspects of your mood. Um, but also customize it um, in a way that you can identify the the symptoms that seem to perpetuate your mood and then track them on your own. Um, but you're really looking at both the biological, the social, and the psychological aspects of your mood. And if you can get even a couple of weeks of data on like how many hours of night do you sleep and is it consistent um, or is it like um, broken up? Um, are you able to eat three meals a day and are they relatively healthy? Um, do you move your body in any kind of way? Do you regularly brush your teeth, shower, um, put on, you know, change your clothing? Um, these are all aspects of, these are all things that can um, be symptoms of a mood disorder. And when you go to get treatment, it's great data for your treatment team to know about. Yeah. Um, if on the other hand, you're a person that is, um, functioning quite well in your life. No one in your life would think that you have depression um, based on your behavioral, you know, your behaviors, um, but you still feel really hopeless, helpless, and worthless. Um, trying to track what triggers you. So you you track similarly to how you tr you track OCD, but you'd be looking at what's the internal or external trigger what thoughts, sensations, and behavioral urges you have, and then what do you do in response? And again, that data can help you increase your self-awareness, but it can also help your treatment team once you get into treatment. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's really practical and useful. Um, yeah, I like that. Um, 
Brilliant. Um, so lastly, uh, if you could pick up the phone and call the 10 year old Maggie, what do you, what would you tell her? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, my 10 year old self was really enjoying her life, but I think towards the uncertainties and the like preoccupation about what would happen in adulthood, I think I'd want to say like life is going to get a lot better It's or it's going to get really good. And for me, there was like a time where the responsibilities of adult life were pretty overwhelming. Mm. Um, but now that I've been an adult for a while and things are, I'm using skills that help me cope more effectively. Um, I really feel like adult life is, um, quite a gift. Mm. So yeah, I'd want to tell that to my 10 year old self. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Um, and then lastly, you've got a billboard in Denver. What do you want written on that billboard? Um, you know, I it wouldn't totally capture the message, so I'm going to say the message now. I would want it to to be stay curious because I've been I've been thinking a lot lately that in addition to courage, curiosity is really what helps mood. And OCD treatment, it curiosity um, gives you the strength and motivation to self-monitor in a way that is necessary. It helps you do the self-reflection that um, helps you change the narratives that maintain mood and OCD. Um, and it can help you have the openness and the courage to connect with other people, even when you're suffering. So stay curious. Um, curiosity is a value that I really think is important to treatment these days. Yeah. Yeah. Really good point. It also helps you keep looking for answers, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, brilliant. Um, yeah, look, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about this topic. Uh, I've enjoyed it and hopefully I'm sure it's helped many people that have listened. Yeah, I hope so. I really enjoyed it too. Thank you so much, Stu. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. And thank you to our Patreons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.